Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. As you're making your travel plans for 2019, remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate, so you get all of the benefits of going through Priceline.com, such as being able to name your own price on hotels, rental cars, airline tickets, and even more, or choosing from great published fares, but part of the uh, purchase price goes to support the great detectives of old time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Now it's time for today's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, the original air date, May 13th, 1962. And this one is The Lust for Gold Matter. Johnny Dollar. Brad Fuller, Johnny. Universal Adjustment Bureau. Oh, no, Pat, please. Forget you ever heard of me. Now, what brought that on? I don't want another assignment right now, that's all. Oh, you don't? I've been going too hard lately, Pat. I'm tired and I need to get away for a few days for a good, solid rest. Well, who said anything about an assignment? Now, don't tell me you're wasting company time and money just to call up and pass the time of day. No? Nope. No, I called to read you a telegram or a cable or whatever it is. Oh? A brother, what a message. It'll make your eyes pop. Who's it from? A fellow by the name of Emmett Gowan. Did you ever hear of him? Are you kidding? That man knows more about fishing than you and I could know in a thousand years. Right. Also, Emmett and I got to be real pals after he helped me solve a rather important case back in, uh, 58, I think it was. I remember that one. But it's been a couple of years since I've heard from him. Where is he? What's he doing? You better let me read this wire. Yeah, go ahead. It says, um, this spot is the closest thing to heaven a fisherman could possibly find. Oh? Sailfish, dolphin, amberjack, snappers, bonefish, mm -hmm. tarpon, just about anything you can think of. Makes my mouth water, Pat, but keep reading. If you don't come on down here and be my guest, and right away it says I'll never forgive you, I mean it, this is really urgent, and it's signed Emma Gowan. Well? What do you mean, well? Well, are you going, you lucky dog? Oh, me? Only thing I don't understand is why he sends a wire like that to a lousy fisherman like you. Oh, Especially man. when he knows me. That's just the point, Johnny. What's just the point? Well, the wire was sent in care of this office, all right, but it's addressed to you. Oh? Yeah. Oh. Sure. <laughs> so if you're so anxious to get away, why don't you take him up on it? Well, sure. What else? And what's the address? Where is he? Pat? Pat, you still there? Sure, sure, I am. Well, give me his address. Uh, why don't you come on over here? And I will. Can't you give it to me over the phone? I could, but I won't. Why not? Well, uh, put it this way. If you will come on over here, maybe we'll pay your expenses. Ah, I get it. You do have an assignment for me, and that telegram's a phony. Oh, it's a McCoy, Johnny, I swear Instead it. Instead of a rest, a fishing trip, all I'm in for is some more work and headaches. No, no, really, Johnny. Then give me Emmett's address. Sure. Over here in my office. That. Okay, okay. You think I'm kidding about the wire? Yes. Well, there's one way you can find out. Well, okay. I'm on my way. The CBS Radio Network brings you Mandel Kramer in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Universal Adjustment Bureau, Home Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the lust for gold matter. Expense account item one. A dollar twenty for a cab into Pat Fuller's office. Much to my surprise, he hadn't been kidding. I mean about the wire from Emmett Gowan inviting me to enjoy what he claimed to be the greatest fishing in the world. And where on the little island of Cozumel off the coast of Mexico. 
Yeah, and if anyone can show you where and how to land the big ones, Emmett Gowan sure can. You couldn't be more right, Pat. So if I were you, I'd pack up my duds and head for the island of Cozumel. And I mean right now. And you know something, Pat? I'll do it. And I just happen to have your plane reservations all set up and waiting for you. Oh, <laughs> Patrick, you're a doll. Yeah. Now, you fly from here to New York to New Orleans, then across the Gulf of Mexico to Merida. Now, that's the capital of Yucatan. Now, wait a minute. And from there, it's only about an hour's flight to Cozumel. Pat. By this time tomorrow, you'll be fighting bonefish or wahoo or tarpon or whatever. At, uh, company expense, did you say? Yeah. Why? <laughs> Don't worry about it. Until after you've got in some fishing. And then? Come on, Pat. What's the hitch? No, 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 no hitch, really, Pat. Johnny. No, no, it's just that, well, you know, after you've had a few days rest and fishing, well, uh, maybe you'd like to fly on over to our Mexico City office. Why? Oh, some client's been reported missing. A man by the name of Juano Ansana. Mm -hmm. His wife wants somebody on it, and, well, as long as you're going to be down that way... I thought maybe you might look into it. After the rest and the fishing. That's the deal. Pat, I still think there's a hitch in here somewhere. Oh, now, Johnny. But, Cosimel, here I come. <laughs> Expense account item two, 7.30 for a taxi back to my apartment, where I packed my bags, and then late in the afternoon, another taxi to Bradley Field. A prop job took me to New York, and less than five hours later, I was in New Orleans. Item 3, 1420, covers a cab from Moissan International to the Roosevelt Hotel, a bed for the night, then a very early breakfast the next morning on the ride back to the airport. Two hours and 40 minutes later, we landed at Merida, out on the tip of Yucatan. I took a ferry plane from there, and well before noon was comfortably ensconced in one of the Cabanas del Carib, a private bungalow overlooking the Caribbean. As I finished unpacking my bags... Come in, come in! Johnny! I just knew you wouldn't let me down. Emmett, how are you? Just fine, Johnny, just as fine as silk. How are you? Well, you want to know the truth, Emmett, I'm bushed. I'm a little beat. And you look it, too. <laughs> Don't you worry, Johnny, a few days of the greatest fishing in all the whole world, and I mean that, Johnny, it'll make a new man out of you. Only one thing I don't understand about all this. What's that, Johnny? Universal Adjustment Bureau footing the bill. Not only for a trip to Mexico City on business afterward, but for this. Did you, um, uh, you ever hear of a man named, uh, Juano Anzana? Then you do know something. Because that's the man Pat Fuller mentioned. Tell you what, Johnny. If we get going right now, maybe we can pick up enough fish for dinner. Emmett, do you know this, uh, Juano Anzana? I have the boat already, all the gas and tackle we need, so come on now. I knew there was a hitch. Well, you ready to start fishing? All right, Emmett. What's it all about? Fishing, Johnny. Emmett. But I mean it. Right now, there's nothing for you to think about except fishing. Well, ready? Okay. I'm ready. For suit, that's a beaut. Look for Daycron on the label, cause Daycron is a man's best friend. A man looks his best in a suit that is able to stay wrinkle-free and neat. In summer rain and summer heat, in coats and slacks, you can relax when you know there is Daycron in the blend. There's just no denying in the clothes you'll be buying, Daycron is a man's best friend. If I told you the truth about the kind of fishing we had that afternoon, you'd call me a liar. So I'll tell you anyhow. Emmett Gowan used an 18-foot skiff, rigged with a pair of 20-horse outboards, and equipped with every size, shape, and sort of fishing tackle you could possibly think of. We cruised southward, around the edge of the little island of Cozumel to a big sort of lagoon with a mangrove island on one side and a palm-lined beach on the other. There, at Emmett's direction, I made my first cast. The result? A fighting mad tarpon that nearly tore my arm from the socket before I could finally work him alongside the boat and release him. On the second cast, a hefty snook made my reel scream. 
The third got me a moon-eyed snapper. The fourth, a log barracuda. Those fish, all of them, were simply begging to be taken on for a scrap. Then when I tied into three tarpon in a row, well, I said it in my minutes, the fishing down there is almost unbelievable. By the time the afternoon was over, I was completely but happily exhausted. Felt better than I had in months. And by the time I lay my weary body on the bed that night, I'd completely forgotten all about the insurance investigation business. And that's something. Early the next morning, about the time the sun came up, Emmett made a careful appraisal of the weather. We climbed into his boat again and set out across the 18-mile strait between Costamel and the Yucatan mainland. Yes, sir, Johnny. You look better already. Emmett, I feel great. Where are we heading for today? Over toward my Boca Pile of Fishing Camp on the other side. Or rather, a little north of it, up toward Matanzeros. Matanzeros? Haven't I heard that name before? An old sunken ship there, Johnny, an old Spanish galleon. Oh, sure, I remember now. A lot of treasure hunters have worked it over. Yeah, including Senor Juan Oanzana. That name again. That is, until he found another wreck the other day, a smaller one. Who is he, Emmett? Why all the mystery? What have you and Pat Fuller cooked up for me down here? Well, let's put it this way, Johnny. It's the piñana. That other sunken vessel we're heading for. Yeah. And the piñana is where maybe we'll use this scuba, this skin diving equipment I brought along this morning. Yeah, I see it here. But, uh, no spears? Well, let's say that now the weather's calmed down enough, we're just going to explore it. This, um, Juan Oanzana found the wreck? Yes. When I brought him over here for some spear fishing. But he's the one that... Johnny, he's the most unlikable man I ever did meet. I wouldn't trust him any more than I would a hungry shark. Emmett. But I had him as a customer, so I had to put up with it. Point is, he's the one who disappeared from Mexico City. Point is, Johnny, that he not only found some fish around the wreck of the piñana, but he found something else. Some old Spanish treasure? I wouldn't say. He wouldn't say a thing about it, Johnny. But I've seen too many of these treasure hunters... And I just knew from the looks of him that he'd found something down there. Well, Emma, didn't you come back later and see for yourself? Johnny, let me put it this way. Yeah? After all those years of fighting for the almighty dollar up north, for the first time in my life, I'm completely contented. I fish a lot. I ride a little. Do some guiding. Gives me everything I need to be perfectly happy. I see what you mean. So why should I spoil it all by trying to find, then trying to hide, and then trying to spend the thing that causes other folks so much misery? Pretty unusual attitude, Emmett. Hmm, maybe so. But I guess it has its points. Johnny, I don't want anything, not anything, to interfere with this, this paradise I've found for both myself and my wife, Claire. That's why I didn't come back here to the wreck of the Piñana. Because I was afraid that I might find some treasure in it. But you think that Juan Oantana did come back, huh? Well, that, uh, that unholy gleam in his eye, Johnny, uh, I felt sure he would. So that's it. So when I got a phone call from his wife in Mexico City that he hadn't come home... And the radio message from your Mr. Pat Fuller at the insurance company yesterday... Then your wire to me was the put-up job, Emmett, between you and Pat. No, oh, in a way, I guess. But he did make me promise to get you a good rest and a lot of fishing. Now, I suppose the first thing to do is examine the wreck and see if we can tell if Ansana has come back to it. And, of course, Johnny, if he's there and working on it, well... Sure, that'll explain his disappearance from home. Emmett. Yes? Yeah. You surely don't think he'd be foolish enough to come out and dive alone. Johnny, where treasure is concerned, a man can sometimes get mighty foolish. Yeah, I guess you're right. And a man like him, Johnny... Yeah? ...could also be mighty dangerous. A few minutes later, at the outer edge of a little cove... He pointed out the vague shadow of the wreck in some 40 or 50 feet of water and almost entirely hidden by a sort of coral overhang. 
Emmett cut the motors, and we drifted into the beach. As we slid the boat up on it... Now, there we are. <clears throat> now he can put on the scuba gear and... Johnny, look. Yeah, yeah, I see, Emmett. Somebody else been here with the boat, too. Yeah. Pulled it over into those bushes. Palmettos, whatever they are. The bushes have hidden it. So he is here. Mr. Anzana? Senor Anzana? I'll go take a look. There was a well-hidden boat in the brush, but no sign of Juan Anzana. Was he out there in the water then, poking around the wreck? Only one way to find out. I put on one of the scuba rigs, the air tank, mask, and flippers. Emmett carefully worked the boat out to the edge of the outcropping of coral. Be mighty careful of that coral, Johnny. It can cut you to ribbons. And then I went on over the side. I was amazed at how clean and clear the water was down there. Once my eyes got used to the pale green light, I could see for literally hundreds of feet in all directions. The water was warm and comfortable, too. Myriad tiny fishes with all the colors of a rainbow dashed in and out of holes in the coral. And here and there, a huge one hung motionless, looking warily at me, the intruder, as I slowly descended into his realm. Then he casually turned and swam away. A rather large shark gave me the beady eye at one point and then decided to ignore me. As for the wreck of the little schooner Pinana, finding it was easy. But so, a few minutes later, was finding something else. Wedged in there between a couple of barnacle-covered timbers was the body of a man. wearing breathing apparatus and flippers was that of a Mexican with a bullet hole in the back of his head. Although the light was poor, I was able to read the lettering on a dog tag on one of his wrists. The name was Juano Ansana. But who had killed him? And why? Could it have been whoever had hidden the boat up there on the beach? Ah, and Emmett's reaction to that boat when he saw it was as though he was familiar with it, knew the owner. I thought of trying to pry the body loose, but then, looking upward, discovered the shadow of Emmett's boat in the 20 minutes or so I'd been down there had moved far over to one side of the coral reef. So instead, underwater, I worked my way over to it and then surfaced. Then, hanging onto the side of the boat with one hand, pulled off the breathing mask with the other and looked up into a very unfamiliar and a very unpleasant face. I do not know who you are, senor, but you might as well come aboard. What the devil? Who are you? And this boat, it's, it's the one I saw hidden over there, and who are you? It's no matter. Here, I will give you a hand. Come on. Oh, sure. But where is... Here. Here right. now. Thanks. Now, listen. No, no, senor. You listen. You see this gun? Who are you? You, senor, will never know. Because you will join him down there, you understand? You will join him. Join who? You talking about the body down there in that wreck? Si, have you si, done... yes, the body of the man I killed. Because he came here after my treasure. The treasure is mine, you understand? He's mine. I find the piñona down there. I find it first. Even the Senor Emmett Gowan, he does not know of it. Now, wait a minute. I see his boat over there, but it's empty. Yeah, he will never know. Nobody will ever know. Nobody but me, you hear? Because I will kill anybody else. See? That is why, now that you have found out, you have found out about him, you must... No, no senor, do not move. You have the gun. See? And I shall use it on you. Before I bury you down there with him. So the secret of the piñana will only be mine. Now look, mister... No, no, senor. <laughs> 
There is no use. You must die. And right now... Must I? After capsizing his boat, I suddenly found that in my struggle with him under the water, I was not alone. From somewhere over near the wreck, Emmett Gowan appeared in his scuba rig. Subduing our unfriendly companion was easy. And when we finally hauled him up onto the beach, completely tamed, out cold as a matter of fact. Well, well, it's this way, Johnny. Like I said, he'd had a bad gleam in his eye. It was more than just from a lust for treasure. It was like you think of madness. You're talking about 101 Sonner, down there in the wreck. In the wreck? Yes. I found his body down there, Emmett. A dog tag on his wrist. No, Johnny. This one's Anzana. What? Yes, this one. He was mad. Don't you see what it means, the body down there? Well, now, I'm not sure. That other man found out about the piñata and came here to investigate. Ansana found him here and killed him. But why put his dog tag on him? So that when he, Ansana, found the treasure, he could just disappear with it. What little was left of the body by then, if it was ever found, more likely just a skeleton, would be identified as his because of the dog tag. Oh, I see. He'd be free and have the treasure, and nobody would ever know that he'd murdered over it. Johnny, I think you're right. Oh, wait a minute, Emmett. Yeah? How come you so conveniently appeared there underwater after I capsized his boat, and when I really needed your help? Well, Johnny, I knew that hidden boat was his. Yeah. But he wasn't anywhere about also, Johnny, there wasn't any sign of bubbles out there to show he was diving. Oh, you're so right. I never thought of that. So, he had to be hiding somewhere and watching us. Of course. So I took my boat around the other side of the reef, put on my scuba, then went on under, where he wouldn't know where I was. At least, that wouldn't make both of us sitting ducks for him. <laughs> Darn good thinking, Emmett. And then when I came up real slow and quiet under the flaring bow of his boat and heard what was going on, when I saw you starting to capsize it, <laughs> I sort of helped. No wonder it flipped so fast and easily. Thanks, Emmett. My pleasure, Johnny. Well, shall we get him back to Cozumel? Why not? I imagine the police might like to see him. You know, the ironic part of it all is that there wasn't one single dollar's worth of treasure in the wreck of the piñata. So he had murdered for nothing. And now, of course, we'll have to pay for it. Expense account total after four more days of absolutely fabulous fishing. Ah, wait a minute. This one's on the house. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, the two-step matter. That means two steps to murder. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar is written by Jack Johnstone, produced and directed by Bruno Zerato Jr. Music supervision by Ethel Huber. Sound patterns by Walter Otto and Don Creed. Johnny Dollar is played by Mandel Kramer. Also featured in our cast were Bob Dryden as Emmett Gowan, Ralph Camargo as Juan Oansana, and Lawson Zerby as Pat Fuller. Be sure to join us next week, same time, same station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Warren Sweeney speaking. Highways are not for sleeping. Stay awake and drive safely. This is the CBS Radio Network. Hi, this is Andrew from otrwesterns.com. I wanted to invite you to come take a look at our site where we put out podcasts of old-time radio westerns. 
Check us out at otrwesterns.com. You're listening to The Great Detectives of Old Time Radio with Adam Graham. Now let's get back into the show. Welcome back. It's important to remember that last week's episode aired about five months before uh, this week's episode. Lest we think Johnny is always tuckered out and getting ready to take a break. Uh, we also did hear in tonight's episode an example of what I talked about a few weeks back with Rocky Jordan about this emphasis that you heard in a lot of Golden Age uh, entertainment of the uh, danger of all-consuming uh, greed for gold uh, and its power to take over someone's uh, life. And I particularly liked Emmett's reasoning. My life is good and I'm happy and I don't want to go down that path. Some decent action in this episode, not a whole lot of mystery, other than whether Johnny's report is being entirely accurate about how good the fishing was. You never know with those fish stories. All right, well, listener comments and feedback now. And we have this email from Julie who writes, I recently bought the Kindle book and audio of all I needed to know I learned from Columbo. Please p tell me the name of the narrator. And uh, that is actually James uh Kilovi, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, and uh, he's uh, narrated a lot of books, uh, 140 available on Audible. So James uh, Kilovi, K-I-L-L-A-V-E-Y. Julie goes on and shares uh, a side story. Uh, she says, I follow the Johnny Dollar podcast. Often my five-year-old grandson is in the car. Uh, one day, he was playing with his action figures who were engaged in a fierce fist fight. The next thing I hear is, take this, Johnny Dollar. Both he and I burst out laughing. He loves listening to radio stories. Well, I'm uh, so glad he's listening and uh, incorporating it into his play. Johnny Dollar as an action figure. I like that. Jim writes, my wife and I listen in the car. Thank you for uh, the great stories. Well, thank you so much, Jim. All right, well, that will do it for today. Join us back here tomorrow for Dragnet, and then next Friday it'll be another episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.